welcome to worship at Mayfield. I invite you to take whatever posture you would like while we're doing our worship music here, but remember no singing here. You better sing loud at home so I can hear you. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I cannot see you with my eyes, let faith arise to you. When I cannot feel your hand in mine, let faith arise to you. God of mercy and love, I will praise you, Lord. Oh, we shine with glory, Lord of light, I feel alive with you. In your presence now I come alive, I am alive with you. There is strength when I say, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy. Jenny Nelson and I work with uh, middle school students in particular but also with the high school and the tweens on occasion as well here at the church and I welcome you to Mayfield Church this morning I do invite you this morning to stand and greet one another from where you are with either a wave a, a sign of peace why don't we do that stand and do that right now good morning good morning good morning good morning morning. Take your time. I'm just getting my papers ready. 
I would like to highlight for you on the back of your bulletin, which you should have found on your seat this morning, it highlights our hands that serve this month, which is uh, for our partner schools, Adrian and Roland. Also as a reminder that today is the Holy Donut Pickup, and for those of you here at the service, it's just over there, and there are two separate lines, whether you have prepaid for the donuts or not, um, and you come in this way, you'll be getting your donuts in there and then exiting over here, uh, just so that we have an orderly pattern and there are marks on the carpet so that you know about how far to stand apart while you're waiting in line. Uh, some of us did it early, uh, but that is where it is, so at least I know how it works though, so that's good. Uh, I would like to let you know that after much COVID delay, that the Confirmation Sunday is going to be happening on Sunday, August 30th. Uh, so we hope to be able to have the Confirmation students and their parents, uh, probably siblings as well, and their mentors. The mentors will probably have to sit apart from them. But uh, my guess is that we'll have them sit towards the front uh, for that service but that will be happening on August 30th, so I'm looking forward to that. That would normally have happened around March, April for us, but uh, we are finally finishing that up, and it's really exciting. I've heard a few of the students, statement, the rough drafts of their statements of faith, and uh, we will be hearing from a few of them on Sunday morning as well, and that's always uh, an inspiring thing to hear what God is doing in the lives of our young people here at the church. I do invite you, especially if you are here at the church, to fill out your connection cards. Uh, I've started mine. I didn't do the prayer side yet. I always try to do a prayer as well. But uh, be sure to fill that out if you are here at the church and then leave that under your seat um, so that you know we can get that information as needed. And I already did the Holy Donut Day. And I think that is everything that I have. So thank you for joining us today, whether you be here in person or online with us. Uh, thank you for worshiping with us today. Thank you. I knew I couldn't read something. It was like there was one more thing I needed to do, but because I went out of order, that messed me up. Uh, let us bow our heads in prayer this morning. Gracious God, you do indeed walk with us, and in these confusing days, we thank you for walking with us, Lord. Guide us each as we make decisions for ourselves, for our families, for our work, for our community, for our schools. We pray that you be with all of our leaders as important decisions are happening within the next month or have already happened. Help us to learn how to work with these decisions for the safety and well-being and betterment of everybody. Lord, help us to be your agents in this world of comfort, of peace, of encouragement. May we each think of one person this day that we need to reach out to that we maybe haven't been in touch with in a while and just give them a call, send them a text, uh, whatever it may be, to encourage them. Lord, we need you, and we need to encourage one another as well. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.
to the neighboring regions, and from there to the ends of the earth. Now, in Jerusalem, their message was received by many and opposed by many, especially by the leaders of the temple. They were scandalized by this new claim that the whole story of Israel had been fulfilled by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. One of these leaders was a man named Saul of Tarsus, who worked tirelessly to stop the movement. That is, until he met the risen Jesus himself. And this encounter transformed Saul from an enemy of Jesus into a herald of his kingdom. And so for years, he traveled about the Roman Empire using his Roman name, Paul, starting Jesus communities all over. And one of Paul's greatest desires was that all of these diverse communities would see themselves as one unified people, regardless of their differences, Jew or non-Jew, male or female, slave or free. Jesus was creating one unified family of equals living together under his rule. And this brings us to the final section of Acts. Back in Jerusalem, where the movement began, the Jewish followers of Jesus were suffering from a drought and food shortage. And Paul was so passionate about the church's unity that he began a major fundraising project among the diverse churches he had started. They would pool their money together so he and a group of representatives could take it as a relief gift to Jerusalem. But it's not safe for Paul in Jerusalem. The Jewish leaders there dislike him so much they want him dead. And Paul knew he was walking into a trap. His friends all begged him not to go, but no one could stop him. And why would Paul risk his life to bring this gift? Couldn't he have sent someone else? Well, for Paul, this was personal. Jerusalem was where he used to participate in the murder of Jesus' followers, and now he gets to serve them. It's also where Jesus himself was executed, and so for Paul, it would be an honor to suffer there alongside his king. Paul goes to Jerusalem, and as expected, he's found by his enemies. A mob forms, and they try to kill him. But Roman soldiers save his life by taking him into custody. The Jewish leaders are accusing Paul of starting a revolt against Rome, but they can't prove it. And the Romans don't know what to do with him. Yeah, they can see Paul's not a criminal, but his claim that a crucified Jewish man is the risen king of the world, it keeps getting him into trouble. And so Paul gets transferred from one court to another until he demands demands that his case be tried before the court of Caesar in Rome. And so, they happily ship him off. Now, throughout this section of Acts, Luke, the writer of the story, has portrayed Paul's trials and imprisonments so that they resemble his previous stories of Jesus' trials and imprisonment. Luke's making an important point. When the people of Jesus follow the way of Jesus, their stories will begin to look like his story, which is beautiful, but it also comes with a cost. On the way to Rome, the boat carrying Paul is hit by a violent storm, and everyone freaks out. Except for Paul. He's below deck hosting a meal, just like Jesus did the night before his trial. Paul blesses and then breaks the bread, promising that God is with them through this storm. And the next day, the ship hits and then breaks apart on the rocks, but everyone's washed safely ashore. Which is amazing, but Paul's not out of trouble. He's taken to Rome and put under house arrest. But it's not so bad. In his house, he can host groups of Jews and non-Jews, sharing with them the good news about Jesus, the risen king. This is a bold move in Rome, the center of power where Caesar rules the world as king. Yes, you have Jesus' alternative upside-down kingdom now growing in the very heart of the world's most powerful empire, all through the suffering of a prisoner. And with this contrast between kingdoms, Luke ends his story. That's a great image, but the story's supposed to be about this message spreading to the ends of the earth. So shouldn't it continue? Of course. Luke has left the story open-ended on purpose, so that his readers would know that the story isn't over, and that they can participate in Jesus' kingdom that is still spreading to this day. So this piece of string walks into a a bar and sits next to this bartender. He asks for a drink, but the bartender says, apologetically, sorry, we don't serve strings here. Confused, the string leaves, and and he goes back home. A few days later, he returns, and this time sitting at a different end of the table. He asks for a drink, and the bartender responds, hey, aren't you that string from the other day? I told you we don't serve strings here. Dejected, the string leaves, and he returns home once again. A few weeks go by, and the string decides to try his luck one more time. He ties himself up, and he pulls apart the top of his his string to change his appearance. 
And then what he does is he enters the, the, the bar and he sits down and he orders a drink and the bartender looks hard and says, you look familiar. You've definitely been around here. Aren't you that string from a while back? And the string looks him right in the eye and says, nope, I'm afraid not. I know, that's bad. But anyone here ever had that feeling before, the feeling that, that something is familiar? That something, you've been there before, or you've done something before, or it feels just so familiar in your own life. Almost like deja vu. You know, we use that term, and I, and I actually looked it up on, on Google and did some look, looking at it, and there's, there are tons of scientific thought on what deja vu is. All the way from dreams to, uh, to different scientific explanations for it. There's whole studies on this stuff, and you know, we... we we have that from time to time, right? You've had deja vu, almost like you've been there before, you've done something before. And this term literally means it's already been seen. It's already happened, already been seen. And as we, we progress here, and as we saw in this video, it, a quick snapshot of what Acts looks like from chapters 21 to 28, we see Paul's life take on kind of a deja vu. And more importantly, you know, I think that we can see the current social climate and circumstances uh, right here in Paul's life toward the end of Acts. You know, sure, you know, many of us have never had to be a part of church or do ministry in a pandemic or the, the current talks and events of things that have gone on that have divided us. It might be new to some of us, but I think it's a good template on how to act as a church and a Christ follower. I think that template is right here at the end of Acts. See, Paul's life in total and his examples here in chapters 21 through 28 show exactly what, what he was all about through his whole ministry, his whole life. If you had to sum it up, I would say it's in one word, unification. The word drove everything he did because it was a, a 180 turnaround from his previous life. You know, we saw he went back to Jerusalem because he wanted to, to he knew he was going to suffer, but he considered that a privilege because of what Jesus went through in the same place. His life was a literal translation of what repentance means, a total 180 from doing one thing to now doing something completely different. And even when, when put on, on house arrests, he, he was still proclaiming the name of Jesus and unification. Through his debates on whether circumcision was needed to enter the kingdom of God, to his letter to, uh, to Ephesus containing, uh, collecting a relief gift, for the many different churches to support impoverished Christians in Jerusalem. House arrest. He was being put on trial for proclaiming Jesus, but he still was unifying by inviting them to come to his house and learn about Jesus in a time that was very dangerous for many Christ followers to just be outside their homes. I'm not going to go into any lengthy detail you know, about any specific verses in these chapters. I will go into a, a couple verses later that we'll go into detail on, but we saw that through the, the video here because it, these really are reports of historical events and kind of what Paul had gone through. But when I sat down to read these chapters and I actually studied them and sat with them, I was, I was completely floored in what I saw. I, I couldn't help but notice that all of these chapters until the, the end of the book of Acts really described our situations that we're standing in here right now. And here's what I mean by that. First, I mean, obviously, as we're looking right now, that this COVID pandemic that we're in right now. You know, we have rules like, like we have things that we have to be, have, wear masks and we have to, you know, sanitize all the time and, and they're, they're really unfamiliar and strange times that we're living in to avoid this, this virus that's circling the globe. It's a pandemic. But if we read here in Acts, we've been here before. This is familiar to us. Because think about it. We're in danger from COVID-19 as the pandemic, and the pandemic in Paul's time was the Roman government. Christians couldn't go outside but without taking specific precautions. That Roman government made it dangerous for any Christian to be outside their homes and their masks were this oppressive government covering their mouths about Christ. 
That was their masks in the day. It made it extremely difficult to even be associated with a Christian. It socially distanced believers. Drove them apart. So what did Paul do? He brought them inside his home. It took a bit more effort, right? And it wasn't ideal. But it unified Christ followers in unprecedented ways. I think today, now more than ever in our current situation, it's difficult to be a practicing believer than it has been in years before. It takes discipline to attend online church instead of sleeping it in or going playing a round of golf. It's difficult to go on things like Zoom to be a part of a group. It gets tiresome at times. But there's a reason why we do that. We, we've begun to gather again, but under certain rules and guidelines to be safe. And now we have social distancing rules, again, that keep us apart, like this one here, where you're supposed to be six feet apart. But here at Mayfield Church, maybe something to, easily to remember, though, that would, be, that would be equal to one Jim Winkler. So make sure you keep one Jim Winkler apart. But, but I truly believe that these times now can bring us together and make us even more stronger than what we've been before. How? I'd like to give an example that we, I go through the student ministry. If, if you don't know me, I, I uh, direct the student ministries here at Mayfield Church. And I want to give you the example here of the high school Bible study that meets on Tuesday nights. I think the past few weeks, we've been closer knit than any time other that we've been. Because what we've been doing is we've been rotating students' homes to meet in. Yeah, we're responsible. We do the things we do to, to keep safe. But we're sharing more of our lives with each other than coming here to church and meeting in this building. Now, it's nothing wrong with the building. We like meeting here. We've had great times here. But when we start to participate in each other's homes, and even my home, I think it's unified us even more. All of our homes of our students have now become church homes. Isn't that cool? The church is gathering there at those homes. It's been unifying with us, and, it, and, it's, and it's tough. I mean, we can't do certain things like, you know, shake hands or hug, but I, I just reconnected recently with someone who I was in youth group with, when I was in middle school and high school, and now we're doing a weekly disc golf thing where we play, go play disc golf. And the first time I reconnected with him, it's, it's probably been 10-plus uh, years since I had talked to him. And when I first saw him, I, I, I just wanted to give him a big hug and say, man, I, you know, where have you been? And catch up like that. And it was, you know, the, the first thing was awkward because I was like, okay, do I, okay, maybe handshake, or, no, elbow, you know, fist bump. What, what, do, we, what do we do? And we got over it, and, but it takes some extra discipline. It takes some extra effort. But do we believe that Jesus is worth it to make the extra effort to do the online thing? To meet in each other's homes? I could definitely see us coming out of this COVID era with, with a renewed sense of passion for Jesus. The other example I see Paul dealing with as it relates to our current situation is division. You know, as I read these chapters, it jumped out at me that there was a struggle between Paul being a Jew or a Roman. A lot of people were confused, okay, wh which one are you trying to be? Are you, are you a Jew? Or, because he claimed Roman citizenship and he wanted to appeal to Caesar, he's like, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. So he's like, okay, which one are you going to be? Are you going to be a Jew or are you going to be a Roman? People didn't know how to view Paul because he claimed both Roman citizenship and he practiced the Jewish law. And on top of that, now he was proclaiming that he practiced the law, but also was a born-again Christian. I mean, what do, you, what? what do you do with that? Confuse so many people. How can someone be all of these things? Shouldn't it have been more black and white than that? Shouldn't it have been, he's either this or he's that? Only a few people sought comfort and residence in the gray, and Paul was one of them. 
He understood that the Christian life meant frequently being caught between truths. For example, Paul made it clear that one could either be circumcised or not be circumcised. You could do whatever. It doesn't matter to be a follower of Christ. He knew that he could follow the law, but also know that his salvation was not dependent on it. Not dependent on the law. This is what we are called to to be today as we live in this tension that we're living in right now especially that of race reconciliation. And it's not just, as Paul was dealing with, Jew or Roman. I mean, there's more than two sides. We've seen it all in the media. Black lives matter. All lives matter. Blue lives matter. It's now been politicized into voting for one person or the other person. As many of you know, there was a rally this past Sunday. Pastor Jim spoke about it when he was up here where there was clearly a dividing line, both physically by the police and in schools of thought between the Black Lives Movement and the All and Blue Lives Matter movement. So I decided to go to that rally with hopes of giving the message of unity like Paul did so many years ago. And I held up these signs. It says, Blue Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, they know that all lives matter. You can say black lives matter and support good blue. Not everything has to divide us. Unity in Christ. And it was funny, too, because during the protests, people were chanting black lives matter, and then the other side was chanting all lives matter, and they were the same, same, they, they, they agree with each other, yet they were using it as a chant to attack each other. So I, I had great conversation with people. Somebody rolled down their window and said, if, if it was, they were, they were in a kind of a beat-up Mazda, and they said, if my horn wasn't broken, I'd honk for you. And I told her I heard her. They appreciated the message and saw a couple, I saw a couple signs with, with the same kind of message on it. Building a bridge. Unifying. It was a good start, but on a whole, there's much to overcome. We've got a long ways to go. And my point is this. If we as faithful followers of Christ do not become conversant in this arena, the Jesus Christ... No. I pointed out on a social media post I saw that the way Christians were being portrayed at the end of this protest was not the Christ that we know and love, And so how are they going to know that without us going into that arena and sharing the love and the message of unity? Several people were there in the name of Jesus, but they clearly manipulated the message Paul and Jesus wanted to convey of unity. We can be these things. We can support each other. You know, at one of the first protests we went to, you know, afterwards, it was a Black Lives Matter one, and afterwards we saw a police officer, and me and my family stopped, and we, we said, thank you for what you do. You guys are great, and we appreciate, and, and the cops, you could see the cops' jaw dropped. Somebody from that protest is now coming to say thank you to me. You know, where, where is that division? Where, where is the message being lost in there? How can we unify that? We simply can't be silent or afraid any longer. People need to know who Jesus really is. Several people that have have talked to us or talked to Kate at at her job at at Tri-C, they're appreciative that someone's speaking up. Someone's saying something. Someone is, is trying to unite this division in our world today. And in the end, it's okay to disagree. Because at least we aren't being silent. And we're being conversant with, in, in conversing with these common issues. What breaks my heart is when I see, like, on social media, the, these pictures that say, if you don't support this, go ahead and unfollow me. If you don't like this, unfriend me. Can't do that. 
can't live in a bubble. We have to be able to talk and understand where other people's viewpoints are coming from. I told you I was going to look into a verse here. 1 Corinthians. It's not in Acts, but it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 22, and it says this. I think this is important in Paul's ministry of unification. He says this, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To the weak, I became the weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so by all possible means, I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. Do you hear what he's saying here? Be all things to all people. Show them the love and the unity that Christ preached in order to bring them in. To show them that nothing has to divide us. We're called to be all things to all people in order to unify them. And under that one thing that is more important than anything else in this world. There's one thing that we don't waver on and that we will stand firm for is who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and how we are changed through Jesus. That's what will unify us. 2017, I got a, a chance to, to meet this guy right here, and he's, if you see the picture, he is just as energetic as his picture looks like. His name's Bob Goff. We've read one of his books here at church. He focuses on being everything to everybody. His recent one, uh, book includes Love Everybody Always. And in his, in his tales that he talks about, and, and what he says, he, sa he, he embodies being everything to all people. And here's what I mean. He's got a Boston hat on right now. I think he's from the Boston area, maybe not. But um, when he's with people in the Boston area, he wears his Boston Red Sox hat. And he corroborates with those people that are Boston Red Sox fans. And vice versa, when he goes, goes to New York, now if you know, Boston and New York are extreme rivals. When he goes to New York, he wears a Yankees hat. I mean, I cannot imagine doing that with a Pittsburgh Steelers hat around here. <laughs> but he does it. Because he knows that, yeah, he might root for a certain team, but that, that doesn't matter. His message is one message, and it's love and unity in Christ. And that's it. Whatever group he goes to and he speaks to and he's a part of, he is in that, he is a part of that group. He makes himself that group. He literally puts himself in the other people's shoes. So here's my question to each of us today. You know, this past Sunday, if each side of those rallies last Saturday could get around 60 people passionate about their stance, which they did, it's about 60 on each side, why can't we get 60 or more Christians to rally and stand up for the unity and love in Jesus? There was, there was nothing like that this past Sunday. Why can't we do that? Why can't we rally in unity and love? Why do we have to vilify another side in order to make our stand? We don't have to do that. It was all about unity for Paul in his life. That's what it was. Connection, togetherness, unity. Unity for God's people and unity for himself as he sought to suffer as his Lord Jesus did. It wasn't comfortable, it took time, and it involved hard things. But it was so worth it in the end. We, we, we have these different groups all around us today, and it's not just what the groups that I had mentioned. There's different groups that look in different shapes and sizes. They proclaim different messages. 
They say, hey, be a part of this, be a part of that, and then another group comes along and says, well, we don't really like that too much, let's, let's be a part of this, be a part of that. I'm going to even go as far as our Christian denominations. Hey, we don't believe this, but believe, we, we, we believe that. You know, where, where is the unity in there? Be a part of this, be a part of another group. They're all, they're all different. They all take different shapes and sizes. But what happens if we all just came together and said, you know what, it doesn't matter. It's about Jesus. Imagine what that could do for our community. It's a magnet. But imagine what this could do if it, it just united everybody under one purpose. Under Jesus. How cool would that look like? What would our worship look like? What would our churches look like? What would our faith look like? So I, I want to leave you with a concrete example of what this would look like. I know faith was at play here, even though it probably wasn't, it's not stated, but you can see it in this video. So I end today with this. I invite you to see one of these rare glimpses that you're going to ever see, and hopefully more in the coming eight days of, of unity that, whether acknowledged or not, only came from the peace and the love of Jesus. Take a look at this video. <laughs> celebration. So what we are going to do is something you're not used to, and we're going to give you two minutes of our platform to put your message out. Now, whether they disagree or agree with your message is irrelevant. It's the fact that you have the right to have the message. I am an American. And the beauty of America is that when you see something broke in your country, you can mobilize to fix it. So you ask why there's a Black Lives Matter? Because you can watch a black man die and be choked to death on television and nothing happened. We need to address that. Yeah. 
it kind of restored my faith in some of those people because when I spoke truths, they agreed. I feel like we had we made progress. I feel like two sides that never listened to each other actually made progress today. Did I expect to go on that stage? No. I expected to come down here, stand here with my fist in the air in a very militant way and to exchange insults, maybe some dirty looks or who knows what, if, if not on a grander level, but just person to person, you know, I think I think we really made made some some substantial steps without either side yielding. And, and, yeah, I hope that they understand that one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement is a proud American and a Christian who cares deeply about this country, who cares deeply about the people in it, whether they are documented or not. I want them to understand that we are educated, all right, that we that we apply a strategy, but we come from a place of love, right? And we really are here to help this country move toward a better place, not to destroy it. A man who controls a 4,000 member militia shook my hand and said, I always knew I identified with you, but today solidified it. Wow. One of the heads of Breakers for Trump came up and shook my hand, asked me to take a picture with his son. A little blonde head kid named Jacob, like, that's special. Like, here I went from being their enemy to someone they wanted to take pictures with their children, and that's the power of communication. We came out, we were going to chant, we were going to do a demonstration, but we didn't have to. We just spoke, and it worked. I'm happy about it.
If you would all stand together for our benediction. Before you leave, if you have an offering today or you would like to give, uh, there will be baskets in the back, um, so you can drop your baskets off there. But if you guys heard during Brandon's last song, I mean, some of you couldn't, I, I heard some singing. And I'm not going to get there and go, no, 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 no. That just means that your heart was so in tune, you, you couldn't help but cry out. You know, and, and you know, we, the COVID can, help, can stop us from singing, but I was over here humming right along, and my heart was singing out decibel upon decibel. And that's what we're called to be, is to be together in Christ. So who can you be unified with today? How can you promote change and community in those around us? May we all strive to be that as one church under Jesus because of what he's done for us, the amazing grace that we just sang. Don't forget to pick up your donuts as well, but go in peace, have a great week in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everybody said, amen.